<clears throat> I think we're timing. We're there. Okay. We'll call the meeting to order the Capitola City Council for Thursday, May 10th. May I have a roll call, please? <clears throat> Council Member Harlan. Here. Council Member Bertrand. Here. Council Member Peterson. Here. Council Member Walter. Here. Mayor Termini. Here. Would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight our meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and ATT UVerse Channel 99, and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday, 8 a.m., and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Yep. Meetings can also be viewed live at www.cityofcapitola.org. And as usual, our technician tonight is the great Lynn Dutton. Thank you very much. Make sure the camera's kind to me, Lynn. And please turn your cell phones off, and we'll start with um, Public Service Week proclamation. Is someone receiving this, or am I only reading it? We, ha we have a few Check. Of, well, then our, of our officers here. And Cap Capitola's finest up here. Okay, this is Public Service Recognition Week, and uh, I, I'm particularly proud to do this each year because I, I have a great deal of gratitude for all the people as, that I've come to know working in the city of Capitola. It goes beyond just a job. And whereas the week of May 6th through May 12th has been designated as Public Service Recognition Week to honor the employees of local, state, and federal government and members of the uniform services, and whereas public employees take not only jobs but also oaths, and whereas those who work in government each and every day help find solutions to our problems, assist those in need, keep us safe, and advance our local, state, and national interests. And whereas without these public servants at every level, community would be impossible in a democracy that regularly changes its elected officials. These unsung heroes do work that keeps our nation running smoothly, and whereas the 66 employees of the city of Capitola provide invaluable service to both residents and visitors every day by keeping our city safe and clean, providing information, helping guide its future development, assuring that taxpayer, do taxpayer dollars are appropriately spent, and more. And whereas public servants include the record keepers, safety inspectors, mechanics, teachers, doctors, nurses, scientists, police officers, firefighters, engineers, accountants, administrators, and city managers, day in and day out, they provide the diverse services demanded by the American people of their governments with efficiency and integrity. Therefore, I, Michael Termini, Mayor of Capitola, do hereby proclaim May 6th to 12th, 2018 as Public Service Recognition Week to thank the people who work for us all. Thank you. <laughs> Gentlemen, do you have anything to say to us? You're on camera. I see I'm on camera. This is very good. I like it. Thank you once again. You all, you all do a great job. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is the presentation of a check from the Capitola Public Safety Foundation to support the scholarships for junior guards. Who has our giant check? Is there anyone here from junior guards? Seeing none, where is the giant check? Let's hold it up. Why don't you, two, we have two board members from the Safety Foundation here. Why don't you hold it up right up here for the camera? There's the camera. Every year, the, the Capitola Public Safety Foundation donates $2,000 to the junior guards in order for families that cannot afford the cost of the tuition to junior guards can still send their children to our amazing program. Thank you, Capitola Safety Foundation. <laughs> the 
Mr. City Attorney, do you have a report on closed session? <coughs> yes. Thank you, Mayor Tremini, members of the City Council. This evening's closed session commenced at uh, 6 p.m. in the uh, City Manager's Conference Room. There was only one item on the agenda. It was labor negotiations pertaining to all bargaining groups, and there was no reportable action. Thank you. Are there any additional materials? Uh, they were previously distributed. We had three public comment um, emails for item 9A, and we had um, revised text for the ordinance for 9E. Perfect. We'll now go to um, public comment. This is the time when anyone from the audience can come up and make a comment on items not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone who would like to make public comment? Seeing none, we'll move on to City Council, City Treasurer, and staff comments. Staff, any comments? Oh, I'm awfully sorry. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Am I on? Am I you on? are. It is, it is your show. Well, my name is Tony Lazzarini, and I live up on, I believe, what they call Cherry Hill. There are several homes up there, and uh, I'm requesting to finally get a street sign because Cherry Avenue is below all the houses, the several homes, and when we try and get Uber or order food <laughs> to be delivered, uh, everyone goes below and no one can find where we live. They're always down below and I think that our street should be named Cherry Lane. It is. And I think that's what they, on some, on some of the GPSs, they call it Cherry Lane. And uh, I also would request the council to maybe walk up there and look at our streets because they are in dire assistance. And uh, I appreciate your time and uh, hope you consider my request. Thank you. And will Public Works, um, can you look into that? Yeah, I do know that's an unnamed alleyway. There's no addresses that actually tie to that alleyway. So I'll, I'll work with the building department, see if we can Good. come up with a name for it and what formal process we need to go through to actually name it. We will, we will get your pizza delivery and your ambulances should you need it. <laughs> no. No, we heard that. Agreed. We got that one. Part. That one came through, and sometimes you don't think about that. You just think of Uber, but I appreciate that. Got it. Thank you. Okay, um, don't push him down the stairs next time, but uh, <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> well, he just doesn't listen. Uh, anyone else like to address the council? <coughs> Welcome. Hey, hi, I'm uh, Marcos Vescovi from Topaz Street, so I'm happy to be back here with you guys. Uh, anyway, just uh, to let you know that we, uh, residents of Topaz Street, we continue to be mobilized to try to improve the situation on the street. The traffic there is not getting any better. <laughs> we had at least one email that you guys might re have received from Matt on one case of someone else being hit. It, it happens. I, I know I didn't send an email on my side from things that I see happening, but maybe we should. Uh, and um, we would like to say that uh, we, today, we, um, we, we are a little surprised when you make the decision for revoking the barricade, and we understood it because we saw a lot of people uh, were not happy with that. But we didn't we didn't see any substantial reason for that. They didn't. We were expecting to hear from the other residents who were unhappy. Looks like the only reason they had is that they don't like to to drive across or go around the block, and so we didn't. We were expecting something more substantial to go against. Uh, but anyway, that being said, we understand uh, that you ask Steve for something that is less impactful, more only on, uh, on Topaz Street. And what we did together, we came up with one suggestion that is much less impactful, yet we think may make a difference on Topaz. We have sent an email to, uh, to Steve and just want to see if it makes sense to maybe touch base with you before you present your solution or, you know, but that's why we're at. So just wanted to 
you know, let you know what's going Great. on our side. Thank you. And we did, we were planning on holding that item tonight, but we, the staff report wasn't quite fleshed out enough. So we're not, we haven't dropped the ball. We're just, we're working on it. We wanted it to be right and it wasn't quite ready yet. So next meeting. Great, great. And Steve, do you think we should touch base with you? Or are you going to respond? Is there a, a little bit I of a dialogue we can have? Already, but I'll, I'll, con I'll continue to support him. I'll, okay. I'll respond more to him. Okay. Very nice. Thank you. I love living in a small town. This is this is the best stuff in the world. Um, we'll go on to treasurer comments. Uh, Chairman e, um first of all, I live near the people who uh, are on, on the... Uh, alleyway there. It's also a problem with the mail. Uh, really? The mailman constantly gets lost. So just another thing to think about. Um, a couple of uh, a couple of numbers that are kind of interesting. I had a quick discussion with our finance director, uh, Jim, and uh, I asked him about uh, something that Jamie said, I think the last meeting, which is we have a, a sales tax shortfall. And I want to know what that number was. He said it looked like it was around 70K which is not devastating, but it's not insignificant. And the concern is, is that, is that a trend? Is it gonna get bigger? Is we gonna see that every, uh, every year? And um, so, it's a, uh, so it's a little bit of a concern. And then coincidentally, we talked about um, the cannabis sales and uh, I'm not sure how that came up, but um, the uh, uh, typical sales for a, a, distrib a distributor is apparently f $4 million. So you figure six percent tax on that. You got m one little outfit on 41st Street is more than going to cover the shortfall. So uh, I don't want to make any moral judgments about a sin tax, but it will cover the deficit that we're seeing. Thank you. Thank you, staff. Any comments? I think the only point I would make is is that look for your budgets tomorrow. Uh, we'll be going to press tomorrow as well uh, on the budgets and hopefully have. Uh, and up on the internet for those folks who are interested at home. Steve? I'd just like to announce that we have two workshops for Public Works next week. On Monday <coughs> evening, we're going to have a second workshop on the wharf project, the Measure F wharf project. We're going to have a presentation from the architect on some ideas of what the buildings could look like, and we'd love any community input we can get on that. And then on Thursday, we will be holding another workshop on the Park Avenue sidewalk project. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Council, Stephanie, what do you have for us? <clears throat> Jacques and I are going to the annual Queer Youth Leadership Awards Saturday night at Soquel High School. And if anyone would like to join us or anyone in the community would like to join us, uh, the students are going to be there with their families getting the awards. They're giving some community awards. They're giving some awards that they call for their allies. They have a lot of partnerships with a lot of different community groups. And so they will be there also. So it should be, I've never gone to it before, but it should be a wonderful I, I event. I haven't. It is, it is great. Yeah. I can't make it, but yeah. it's excellent. Jock, anything? Um, thanks for putting out about the public meeting, Steve. I appreciate that. And as I said to you last week, um, when the flyer's ready, I'll be glad to distribute those. And um, I guess Monday I could pick them up. Thanks. Kristen? Nothing? Ed? I have nothing. Um, I would like to call everyone's attention to the latest uh, art and cultural project being installed this week in front of Bella Roma Cafe. Uh, we were responsible for that lovely artistic railing, and there's another two sections at each end up the ramp that still need to be installed, but it is as wonderful as we thought it would be. It was a perfect uh, perfect timing because Public Works had a project to replace that railing. We saw a need for more public art in that area, so the Public Art Fund was able to supplant the Public Works budget and take that on as an art project. So we'll wait for its completion, and uh, everyone loves it. Um, and also, Steve, while you're there, while you're sitting up here, I received a letter from the uh, Homeowners Association president at Brookvale Terrace. They've been having their share of PG&E issues, and they have transformers catching fire huh. in the ground. And I know there are dual subsurface transformers throughout that park, and they'll get one that catches on fire, and they'll just replace that one and not replace the other. But having three in a several-month period seems like life and limb, maybe we can reach out and help them as well. I'd be happy to contact a government liaison for a PG&E and share the letter with them. 
And speaking of the uh, outreach for the wharf, the architect, the chosen architect, w after <laughs> meeting with a panel, after sending out RFP, you know, we went through a, a pr an exhaustive process, but um, the folks uh, across the street at Fuse uh, were the architects for the, the buildings, and I might draw attention to the building they're doing just two doors down from them, which is shaping up to be truly a remarkable piece of architecture. So thank you, Fuse Architects. Moving on, um, we will go on to the um, consent calendar. These are items taken on a single vote. We have regular, regular council meeting minutes, um, mid-management employees outline job description, and we have a slurry seal project. Does anyone want to pull any of these items? I just have a question. Questions? I Stephanie. I think we were going to maybe change the, um, does and the slurry seals, there's a um, item that lists Capitola Court. Is that a private road or is that a public street? It appears to be an, uh, unknown at this point and I'm looking into it before right. we move forward with it. Certainly we have, main, what I've been told is historically we have maintained it, although it appears to be on private property. Okay, thank you. So we'll look at it before thank we proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have a comment. So I think that was a great uh, catch on Stephanie's part, but if it is private, um, maybe they would like to pay the fee so it's a, a unified you know, seal uh, going up to Capitola Avenue. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I so move. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. We'll move on to general government public hearings. And the first item is finalize the scope of work for the Jetty Rehabilitation Project. Very exciting, Steve. <laughs> Doesn't get better than this, so. No, that's the truth. Um, one of the th three Measure F projects that we're working on to try and accomplish is rehabilitation of the jetty. Just to make sure everybody's oriented, uh, obviously an aerial looking at the beach, here's the esplanade. So the jetty is this uh, rock structure on the eastern end that uh, is very responsible for the, the beach we have. Um, without it, uh, there is no beach here, uh, a very small one right in front of Zelda. So um, it was originally built in, I believe, 1969. Um, over the, since that time it has settled. I think significant settlement has occurred over the last five years. Um, no real reason for that. I think it's become more noticeable. Uh, the project is to uh, restore it to its original configuration. Uh, we've had conversations with the Coastal Commission about it. They, uh, we did do a sand study. That has been the focus of our work of folk, um, how sand transports around it and the effects um, extending its uh, rebuilding it will have on that so we've completed that study. The next thing we also talked about when we scoped out this project originally was to um, add a walkway out onto it um, so that uh, an ADA sidewalk for lack of a better term could be built out to go on the point similar in nature but certainly much smaller than the one on the uh, jetty at the Santa Cruz that goes out to the lighthouse there. <coughs> um, this would be a eight foot wide um, concrete sidewalk that would uh, be at the same grade that it is now. Um, so as part of uh, our outreach on the Measure F projects, we've um, held some a community meeting already on it and we've had some you know conversations with members of the public. Um, here's some zoom in, zoom in looks at what it would look like. You can see it would tie into the esplanade here. Uh, this is toward uh, the smaller jetty in Upper Esplanade Park. It's the last opening in the headwall. Come out and you can see it kind of traverse right along the sandy beach here to tie into the uh, rock jetty itself. Um, at the workshop, we presented two alternatives. One is to uh, rebuild the jetty as it is uh, without the walkway or to include the, the walkway. Um, as you can see here, the, each dot represented a vote of people in attendance and uh, not including the rockway uh, was an 11 to favorite uh, at that meeting. Um, that was consistent with um, individual me uh, confer conversations, public and we've had with members of the public. Um, there's been very little support about building that way. And I think the main reason is that's just, that's probably the most popular part of the beach. Um, you know, the swimming hole over here on the, uh, on the east of the jetty is a great place for surfers to go out and 
smaller kids to play. It, it certainly has a lot less surf than the main part of the beach. Um, the main entrance coming off of Esplanade Park is right here. And it's just, this is a very crowded area. And to put a concrete walkway and uh, across there, um, it's just it's not popular. Um, so let me move here. Um, our goal is to begin construction um, this winter and be done by this time next year. So as we're rolling into summer, we're done with our construction on the beach. We're also going to do the flume rehabilitation at the same time. Um, we're going to do that as one project. And like I said, we want to get them done um, before May 1st. In order to do that, we have to have applications. Um, it's going to take Corps of Engineers permits and uh, Coastal Commission permit and Regional Water Quality Control permit. So we need to start that process probably July 1st is our target date to start that. Um, so we need to finalize the scope of that work now. Um, like I said, public input that we've received both at the workshop and individually have been against the project, mainly because of the busy beach. <coughs> Concern was raised about ongoing maintenance and repair costs. Certainly we all know that je that jetty itself gets battered by waves. Um, it's not as high as Santa Cruz, so I assume we could anticipate some repair costs to keep it open over the years and risk management. So um, our recommendation is to approve a jetty rehabilitation scope project, project scope that does not include the addition of a walkway at this time and direct staff to proceed with the final plans and permitting. Steve, question for you. I think we were, we were talking about uh, some potential grants that might help us with this, especially since we have some of our uh, tax measure money to match. Is there anything on the horizon? Can we get any applications out to help us with this one? On the jetty project, I don't see it. I mean, we're, we're talking a small portion of Measure F at this point. We are feverishly looking for um, wharf grants for our wharf project. I think that's a much better candidate, um, okay. to be honest with you, because that, that has a bigger impact on everything we do. But um, I don't think, there's nothing in the pipelines now that we're running across, and in order to get this built, I don't think we have the, the time frame to wait for a, a grant for the jetty itself. And could, during the course of this, uh, is there a possibility that some miscellaneous large pieces of rock could accidentally fall on our second sand groin and, and help <laughs> that not go away? I didn't hear that. Okay. So, Jock, <laughs> do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, so I did go to the public meeting and um, I heard the comments about, you know, why the pathway wouldn't be um, a good idea. Um, so I support listening to the public. Um, that's, um, uh, there were some pretty good comments. So I, I think you reported that quite accurately. Um, there was another comment that came up, which uh, you didn't know the answer of. You may not at this point, And that was after you put out the plans of the as-built jetty, which was approved some time ago, uh, the questions came up from a lot of people there. Did it actually get built to that specification? And the, the wisdom was that, well, that's what was approved, but it still was sort of hanging in the air because what was planned did not quite look like what the jetty is today. Of course, it's sloughed and all that, but really didn't suggest what was actually planned. So the, the, the center line, the concrete spine that goes down the center appears to be the right length and all that. The rocks get stacked to the, to the right height and, and spread out. <coughs> Unfortunately, we, you know, we don't have answers. The plans are stamped as built. If that's what we're designing to. Um, is it going to look exactly how the plans show it when we're done? Probably not, but it'll be close. And the, the big thing is the height and the length will be what was there before or what was, what was designed before. And that's what influences the sand. Right. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Any other questions of staff? Ed. <coughs> Steve, I'm just curious why the range so large from 250 to 800,000. Yeah. I, I probably could have refined that some. Um, that is a range because they hadn't surveyed it um, and to see how much rock we need to import to bring it back yet. Um, I just pulled that off of their proposal that they did when um, the engineer, we hired the engineer. Um, right now, it looks like it's about a $300,000. Um, repair without the walkway. Thank you. Question. I just, just curious here. to know if, if there's a rough cough, cost differential between sidewalk and no sidewalk. Oh, yeah, there was. How much more for the sidewalk? The, putting the pathway is about another 125 to $150,000 on you. top of placing all the rock. 
I'll open this discussion up to the public. Anyone who'd like to speak on this subject, step right up. Hold it, hold it, hold, st pause. <laughs> step up to the microphone. Even though I know who you are, tell everybody else who you are, and then you got three minutes and it's your show. Yeah, maybe faster than that. My name is Jack Digby and I live at 103 Lawn Way, which is on top of El Toro Bravo, directly across from where the proposed sidewalk is. And I think that the beach allows for handicap access and I think that's evidenced by the recent Operation Surf where disabled veterans are allowed to come to the beach and be there. So I think that our beach is handicap accessible and I don't, I don't think that the sidewalk is, is, is a really good idea and I love to go to the beach every day and walk on the naked sand and the rocks. I know that they're not all, you know, entirely natural, but you know, I, I build concrete structures and that's part of the value of my, my home is that in, right in front of my door, I can be with, in nature and there's no more sidewalks. And that's, I think Thank that's you. just the value of my home. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak to us on the subject? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council. Stephanie, you start. I'll move the staff recommendation. I second. We have a motion by Councilmember Harlan, second by Councilmember Bertrand. Uh, any other comments? No. Any comments, Jacques? Any comments? Any comments? Mr. Ed. Just just real quick. I, I originally, when we started talking about this, I, the idea of the walkway was enticing. I think it was a great thing to, to possibly deliver for ADA access. Unfortunately, because of the way that it works out, you know, construction-wise, it's not prudent to do this because I can see we would probably be repairing it over and over and over again. I, I, like I said, when we first talked about this and, and the idea came up, that's why we're even talking about it. It, w it would have been a nice feature to have. It's just the way that the jetty connects to what we have doesn't make it possible. So for those people that were in favor of it, the reason we're not gonna do it is not because of the cost. I think just because in the long run, it just would become a maintenance problem and it takes away. I think there's more that, there's less to gain than there is, there's not as much to gain as it would be to lose by having an ongoing problem. So uh, just for those people that were in favor of it, just wanna make a mention that I think the prudent decision is to just rebuild it as is and, and forego the sidewalk. So I concur with the motion. Okay, and we have a repeat. Jacques is taking another bite. Yeah, I'm t a repeat, I'm sorry. Carry Unless on. You want to jump in to, no, okay. Um, I, I would like to comment the, the meeting was well run and there was quite a few participants. Um, I don't think everyone actually put their dot on the, uh, the uh, survey, but um, there was a lot of discussion. Um, the survey sort of encapsulated some of the ideas, so it sort of focused everyone's thoughts. So I think it was well run and I thank you for that. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved, unanimous. Thank you. Council, we'll move on to our next item, which is the introduction of an ordinance amending Chapter 13.02 pertaining to water conservation, plumbing, fixture, retrofit requirements. Our life overflows with excitement. Really quick. Um, in 2003, the city adopted an ordinance to require retrofit of plumbing fixtures and properties at time of sale. They have to put in uh, you know, water conservation uh, fixtures. Uh, the two water districts that service the city, both City of Santa Cruz Water District and Soquel Creek had requested that we put in a <coughs> section of our code that requires it. The code actually specifies that they're in charge of implementation. Uh, Soquel Creek has recently decided they no longer on it, want to implement it uh, because they have achieved um, diminishing returns on it. They fe feel that 90% of their plumbing fixtures have been retrofitted and the cost of running that program is, uh, exceeds the benefit at this point. So um, we also contacted the city of Santa Cruz. Um, they are interested in continuing to enforce it until for a couple more years until 2020. So our recommendation tonight is to amend uh, chapter 13.02 simply to remove any reference to Soquel Creek and the Soquel Creek service area from it. And it will only apply to the city of Santa Cruz water service area. Um, in 2020 or when we get notified from the city of Santa Cruz, we'll return and repeal the entire ordinance. Steve, what would be the ramifications of us just taking out the word SoCal Creek and just letting it go so that, yeah, I, I just, uh, it baffles me that in this time of water being a concern that we would ever take away any requirement to not retrofit plumbing fixtures. 
Um, what if yeah, we release SoCal District? It becomes District. an enforcement issue, and, right? and, and, and doing that requires tracking when the property is sold, going out doing inspections. There's quite a bit of staff time involved in, in managing that that uh, would be a burden on the city at this point to, to implement. Um, we could have an ordinance that we don't right. do, um, right. and that's something maybe we consider in 2020, um, but that's our concern. One of the things to keep in mind, though, is, is this has is this is a requirement on the resale of property, and you know how title companies are. Um, so, it's a situation where having an ordinance that maybe isn't enforced actively uh, could become problematic in the sense that we could end up with situations where people are banging on our front door saying, "My title company won't let me close escrow my house until you sign off on the inspection." So. It's, it's, there are certain cases where we definitely have items in our ordinance which are not the highest priority for enforcement, but when it deals with real property, uh, I think we want to make sure that we have a pretty tight um, tight control and make sure that what, or the language that we have is actually what we can enforce. Given the real estate market in Capitola, how many closings do you think we have in a week in Capitola? If we had one, I'd be surprised, especially given the housing stock in Capitola for sale. Um, if I may note, we do receive the Capitola uh, or the um, Santa Cruz record, and there are, I would say, an average of three properties in Capitola each week. Yeah, that's listed in that. Three ca three properties change hands each each that's week. My impression, yeah, because we check it each week for other things. I mean, keep keep in mind it's the water districts job we have a water district rep here if you have any questions but it's their job to make sure that they're using their funds effectively to make sure that they're using the water prudently and they've made the decision that it's not an effective use of their resources to continue to implement this program so I think for us to keep it on our books I'm, I'm just concerned with what the implications would be if we had this ordinance on the books and we don't really have a mechanism by which to enforce it could we could they get a note from their plumber <laughs> uh, that's that's said only partially in jest, but I'm saying, you know, it seems pretty simple. And just because Silco Creek may not have the resources to police something like this, it is, it's a clear and present concern to the whole community with water. I, I just feel uncomfortable releasing anything having to do with this. We have especially the number of old houses we have in Capitola. I don't know. How do you address the council? Do we have, wait, do we have anyone from the public who would like to speak public? to us? Yeah. Please, come on up. Welcome. Council members, I'm Shelley Flock. I'm the conservation manager at SoCal Creek Water District. And the reason why we are um, exiting from this program is not just staff time, but diminishing returns. So we've executed this program um, in the city of Capitola and the portions of the unincorporated county within our service area for 15 years, and we've replaced thousands of toilets and shower heads and urinals through the ROS program itself, the retrofit on sale program. We've also been offering toilet and urinal and shower head rebates since 1997. And again, we've done thousands of replacements of fixtures to the standards that are called for in the retrofit on sale ordinance um, over those years. We've also required all new development um, since 2003 to offset at least two times the amount of water that they're expected to use and the way that that's been accomplished is through again thousands of, of fixture retrofits so we're basing our decision on the fact that we've already accomplished we've succeeded with this program and there's very few uh, non-compliant fixtures left in our service area so that's really the, the nugget <coughs> of it in fact a lot of our programs our rebate programs and our water demand offset program we're going beyond the minimum um, efficiency standards in the ROS ordinance, as well as the California Green Building Code um, requirements for fixtures. So we're, we're on to the next generation of fixture retrofits through most of our conservation programs. Well, that, that was gonna be my next question. Is there another level of technology that's taken place in the last 20 years that we could put into our ordinance in 2020 to say, you know, now you have to do this kind of plumbing fixture? Yeah, I mean, it's possible the lowest um, that we would recommend for residential uh, toilets is 0.8 gallon per flush. Those are considered ultra high efficiency toilets. 
Um, they're not really recommended for commercial settings mm -hmm. because of the high fre higher frequency of use and the fact that you don't have as much drain flow carry from things like showering and clothes washing and, and right. um, you know, dishwashing. So, you know, I think it, we've just su succeeded in this program and carried it out to the extent where we're getting very few returns for the amount of staff time that it's taking to go out and verify compliance. Um, so that's really what we're, what we're facing and we're looking at um, expanding some of our other programs with that staff time. And is our requirement in the existing ordinance for the 0.8 no, gallon per flush? It, it basically says that if um, you have a 1.6 gallon per flush or greater toilet, um, we'll focus on that because that's the, the biggest water using fixture in most homes. Um, if it's 1.6 or greater, you have to replace it with a 1.28 gallon per flush toilet. But if it's already, um, if the existing toilet is a 1.6 gallon per flush, that's compliant under the code, the current City of Capitola ordinance as well as the county ordinance. So uh, 1.6 is, is uh, being allowed to remain and they don't have to be replaced with 1.28 gallon per flush. S seems like we have an opportunity, if not tonight, then in 2020 to push this to the next level. And I think that that's significant enough when you talk about those kind of numbers mm -hmm. and you talk about the, th the many thousands of toilets in the city that it could make a difference. Mm -hmm. I know that there's concern at the at sanitation because we're actually not pushing as much liquid through the system and it actually is a problem for them. Mm -hmm. But that's another issue. So I'm, I'm reluctantly going to agree with you, but I'm still very, very nervous with regard to releasing any kind of water conservation. Uh, let me just ask, is there anyone else in the, in the audience like to speak to us on this? Seeing none, we'll bring it back. Stephanie. I, sh I share your concern about changing any water regulations, but and we probably do have a bunch of old toilets in the old homes, but the people buying them are gonna tear them down and remodel. Yeah. So on, the, on that hand, you know, I, I, think, I think we're pretty good, in pretty good shape. <laughs> And yeah, that's another piece of the, yes. um, the equation is that uh, since 2014, um, there's been point of sale regulations that have said you can only sell 1.28 gallon per flush toilets in the state of California. Um, the building code uh, also requires when you're remodeling to replace fixtures that meet the building code, which is 1.28 gallon per flush and two gallon per minute for shower heads. So, there's other um, naturally occurring things in addition to the district's conservation programs that are taking care of these fixture replacements. Understood. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, Ed, anything? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not willing to micromanage the water district. I think if they've said they've reached their goal, that's good enough for me. Uh, and I really don't want another ordinance on our books that we are not going to enforce. It doesn't make any So for that reason, I'm going to make a motion to approve staff recommendation. Se second, uh, as, a, as a first reading of the ordinance. Okay. Kristen, any comments? Jacques, any comments? I commend the Water District for having this program to begin with. Thank you. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much, Madam City Clerk. We'll, we'll move on to our Recreation Division Report. Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, this item is on your agenda this evening at the request or uh, at the request of Council Member Bertrand during last year's budget cycle to take a look at the Recreation Division. Um, so attached to your packet is a, a pretty comprehensive report that was pre prepared by our uh, Recreation Manager. Um, bit of background, in 1997, the JPA, which is a Joint Powers Authority, a partnership between the school district and the city to provide recreation services within our boundaries, dissolved. And at that time, the city began providing recreation services. Um, we've done it ever since, and our recreation supervisor has worked for both the JPA and for the city continuously uh, for the entire time. Um, Elise has announced her retirement. Uh, she will be leaving us shortly, so it is certainly a time of change and uh, probably a good time for us all to be looking at this. Um, so in summary, the recreation division is housed out of the community center at Jade Street, um, <clears throat> manage the softball field, the soccer fields, at both Monterey Park as well as at Jade Street. Uh, the division is staffed by the Recreation Supervisor. 
um, two recreation coordinators, recreation assistant, and then the recreational facilities custodian. In addition, we have a whole bunch of part-time seasonal staff that come on board each and every summer to help out with junior guards and Camp Capitola. Um, four major programs in recreation. We have the classes, we have the sports rentals, sports and rentals, uh, Camp Capitola and Junior Guard. Um, the classes, so the classes are taught by contract employees to the city. They're not taught by city employees. It's sort of outside specialists that'll come in and teach a class um, to, through our program. We have about 75 classes per session. We have 40 different instructors. Uh, around 10 to 15 percent of the classes that we offer in any given session are usually new, uh, for being offered for the first time. Uh, looking at the demographics, which is included in the report, the things that jump out at me is number one is is uh, we draw we do a lot better job of providing classes uh, for women than we do for men, and predominantly our class participants are between the ages of uh, 40 and 70. So sort of an older demographic. Um, most classes are held at the community center, um, but some off-site facilities are sometimes used. So the, the, the rental and sport, sports and rental division, they manage the rental of the community center for private special events, and then the, the sports, um, the fields for sport, youth sport leagues. Um, in addition, then we have the sport leagues, and one of the things to keep in mind about the sport leagues, the, is a long-term trend that's really become pronounced in recent years is that current generation of adults is not participating in sports leagues the same way that um, baby boomers did. That there are just fewer sort of company softball teams. Uh, there were fewer broomball leagues. Throughout the country, enrollment in sort of adult sports leagues has significantly decreased over time. Uh, we do continue to still offer adult softball at Jade Street Park. Um, and, and then one of the real the sports leagues that are used uh, frequently is the tennis courts on our brand new well-surfaced courts at Jade Street. Uh, camp Capitola, I think everyone's familiar with Camp Capitola. We have four sessions of camp every summer, uh, ages six to 11, takes place out of the community center. We hire more than 20 seasonal employees to help out with the, summer, the program each summer. Uh, we've seen enrollment declines in Camp Capitola particularly in recent years uh, that coincide with the, um, the swim center. Simpkins, is it? Boys the Boys and Girls Club. Boys and Girls Club have offered some additional uh, day, day camps in our area, and we've seen sort of the additional competition from Simpkins, I believe, and from the Boys and Girls Club uh, has impacted the enrollment at Camp Capitola. Uh, and so staff's looking for a way to attract more participants, uh, but we don't have a pool, which is one of the real the real things that Simpkin certainly does have. Uh, junior Guards is our most popular recreation program. Uh, we capped it out, as you'll recall, recently at 1,000 participants, max total, between the ages of six and 18. Uh, we have two morning, and, and well, we have one morning and one afternoon um, session, and then two sessions a summer. So there's four total opportunities, sort of chunks of Junior Guard time a summer. We host an annual competition here, and then we participate in both local and regional competitions with our Junior Guard program. And we have between 25 and 30 seasonal employees that get hired through the Junior Guard program uh, to help run it. So you'll recall that over, over time, there's been increased challenges that we've had associated with the Junior Guard program around the training and the fact that our Junior Guard program was different from other Junior Guard programs around the state and that our program wasn't run by lifeguards. Our program was run by folks that were experienced watermen and women, but not necessarily lifeguards. So we have been morphing our program, and in 2016, it really came to a head in that we, were, we weren't, we didn't have our own local chapter of a California Surf Life Saving Association. And essentially, we were told that we would no longer be able to compete at regionals unless we had a chapter. So in last uh, two years ago, council directed us basically do what it would take to get our own chapter and we've done that uh, we shortened the first week of train the first week of camp to give more time to train the instructors we have a beach captain on staff each summer now and um, we actually our chapter is going to be considered by the USLA uh, very shortly so we find out whether or not we actually get our own chapter and those changes we talked about at the time that those changes were going to increase costs and reduce revenue 
Uh, we estimated around $100,000. It's, it's been more than $100,000 of increased cost and decreased revenue. So it hasn't come cheap. Um, so thinking about kind of the future challenges of the recreation division um, is that one of the things to think about is, is 20 or 30 years ago, if you wanted to do a class or you wanted to start offering a class in your community, the only place to turn was the public recreation department, right? Or at least the barriers to entry were certainly far lower through a public recreation program than they would be any other way. Um, simply because it was hard to get your name out. It was hard to find clients. Today, if you wanted to set up a yoga studio, it's relatively easy to find available office space or old retail space. There's a, a lot of that on the market and put an ad on the internet, put up a Facebook site, you know, do your social media marketing and you can get your space and get yourself operating. So there's a lot more competition from the private sector than there used to be for these sort of recreation classes. Um, and then what's happened is, is that that means that a lot of the facilities that get opened up specialize, whether it's a dance studio that's got I don't know the terms for the dance studio, but the glass walls, the springy floors, the, the bars, or the rock climbing gyms. There's a lot more of these specialized facilities where today our, we have our community center, which is, is getting longer in the tooth and relatively tired. It's difficult to have multiple classes going on at the facility. So there's increased competition from the private sector, both in the technology and in terms of the infrastructure, infrastructure as well. Um, looking ahead, uh, we have a challenge in front of us with Elise leaving us, um, but there's also an opportunity. So this challenge is gonna be getting through this summer. Um, we will be overseeing the recreation department with existing resources. Uh, Larry has picked out a couple pairs of shorts and a uh, straw hat, and he's gonna be spending time up there, I think, this summer. Uh, we will be looking at extra hours for our, our rec staff up there as well. Uh, we will be getting in recruitment very soon for a new recreation supervisor. Um, and then once we have a new recreation supervisor on board, I think it's a real opportunity to take a hard look at our program and evaluate, you know, what, what is the future of capital recreation and how do we, how do we want to focus our resources um, to best provide services in our community? Mr. City Manager, um, is the recreation, is Elise a department head no. or does she work under a different department? She works in the city manager's department. Under the city manager, okay. Do you, is there any, um, thought about restructuring that whatsoever? Any savings, your time, city time, all around? Well, is it, is it just yes. right? Is it just right the way it is? I, that's what I'm trying no, to get. No, no, it's not just right the way it is. Um, it's not just right the way it is. I think I think that we need to look at that. Um, whether it's whether it moves to a different department, whether the reporting structure is to a different piece of the city manager's department. I think those are open questions that we do need to need to look at. Right. Because, I mean, I, I have a lot on my plate and spending time up at the rec center is just, it, it, it rarely rises to the level of a priority that it probably should be. Um, so I think that we could provide better oversight through other mechanisms. Understood, any questions of staff? Then I will open this up to the public. Anyone would like to speak to us on this item? Peter. Just ask a question: Is the is that a salaried position? Yes. Do uh, you want to tell me? No, I'll look. I'll ask later. And uh, let me just to note: even though we have lost revenue and increased costs for junior guards, it still remains more or less self-funded as far as charging for it. At least those are the numbers that we were brought by the junior guard parents at some point. That junior guards does is self-funding. Well, I, I, I think that the numbers that you were presented were were not entirely. I mean, y yes, the cost of hiring all the instructors is covered by the fees that are collected, but the infrastructure around having the program in the first place, in other words, the all the back of house staff, the recreation supervisor, the recreation coordinators, all those staffs, and once you start taking, saying that that's 25% of our recreation work. The overhead. Yeah, the overhead, it, it doesn't cover the overhead. Okay, I, I just wanted to establish that. I want anyone to think that we're just slicing $100,000 out of the general fund. It, it's close. It's a lot closer now, but and we may be to the negative rather than to the positive. We'll, we'll have the opportunity to take a look in the uh, 
the uh, pending budget here. And Good. Look at the record. I want to bring it back to council. I don't know if there's any uh, any action, just except receiving the report. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to defer to Jacques, who asked for this report. What was the thrust of the report? I mean, what did you hope to gain from it, and what is the eventual outcome you're looking for, Jacques? So um, thanks for doing the report, and Larry, I understood you did a lot of the work also. So. Um, Basically, we're considering spending a lot of money on the building at Jade Street Park. And so I think in terms of expenditure of city funds, do we have a recreation center there that's meeting the needs of the people of Capitola in the broader area? Because we also um, have programs that go to the Soquel School District. That's our broad area. So as you noted in the report, Recreation districts or the offerings from cities has changed and the whole environment has changed and so I'm glad you brought that out. So what I wanted to do was have a chance, create a chance to relook at what our recreation department is and actually reach out to the city residents in the broader area of Soquel School District if we can to find out are we meeting their needs? Are there things that the public would like to see us provide that would be more in, in concert with what they actually would like to see from a recreation department. Um, I'd like to do that via, you know, a community uh, committee, you know, people in this town to actually design a program to reach out, to actually have hearings, to get input from people so that we could get some real data and try to see if we could come up with programmatic changes that would try to meet those new ideas or those new directions or thrusts. Um, one that particularly bothers me is I don't think we're doing enough for the children in this area. So as your report brought out, most of the people that are taking the classes are 40 to 70. So I think we're missing possibly demograph huge swaths of the Democrats, uh, Democratic, excuse me, the demograph, thank you very much. That really bothers me and you know I'm I'm involved in a couple of committees that are focused on children and I realize that one of the main problems that children have as they grow older is there's not significant number of activities for them that are healthy activities that keep them from getting in trouble and I was talking to Mike about this and there's a little idea that I think that should be thrown in there and one of them is that children parent activities. As you know, I was on um, a trustee of a school district in San Lorenzo Valley, and we noted that parent participation was excellent when the kids were young, but then waned and dropped off as they went to high school. The needs of kids probably get even more dramatic as they reach ages like tween years and stuff like that. They really need parent participation. So that's one thing that concerns me. And so I'd like to see that we make an effort to reach out to the community, which is hard to do, I realize, but as your report pointed out, the whole area of recreation has changed. And so I'd like to make sure that when Capitola spends its money on providing a recreation, a recreation program, that it's actually spending its money well. Thank you. And and meeting the needs of the community. To me, that's the most important thing. We provide services, and I want that money spent well to provide a good service for our community. Thank you, Jacques. Stephanie. We could put an article in the newsletter and give the email, city email address and ask people to send us emails about what kind of activities that we're not having that they would like to see. Great idea. Anyone else have any comments? Then we'll consider the report received. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next item, which is consider a resolution opposing the um, soft drink industry backed tax fairness, transparency, and accountability act of 2018, which is <clears throat> a very egalitarian name for a very devious uh, proposal. Uh. Give me a. All right, we're on. I have a relatively short presentation for you. Uh, this is, as the mayor noted, <clears throat> a resolution opposing a item that's out for signature now, um, or I believe it's still out for signature, that's backed by the California Business Roundtable. Um, the, it's called the Tax Fairness, Transparency, and Accountability Act of 2018. 
uh, it would have a number of really significant impacts should it pass um, voters in November. Uh, specifically, it would eliminate the 50% general tax taxes that the city would have any ability to pass. So all new taxes would require a two thirds vote. Um, in addition, it would require two thirds of the city council, so four fifths really, because we don't round off to two thirds very nicely of a council to put any item on a ballot. And in addition, there's also another piece of the puzzle is, is that it would narrow the threshold, legal threshold to challenge one of our um, fees that are set for things like fence permits or tree removal permits from actual cost to a reasonable cost. So just because we do a fee study and we show that it costs us $150 to issue some type of permit, somebody could challenge us and say, well, that's not reasonable. Um, so there's another potential uh, issue with it as well. Ironically enough, if this were to pass, all it requires is 51% of California voters if it makes the ballot <laughs> pass. Uh, and it applies retroactively. So anything that has passed this year would be null and void unless it includes very specific language uh, in the ballot measure and receives two-thirds uh, support from the voters. Um, this measure is very clearly backed by the American Beverage PAC. Uh, it's a PAC that represents the soda industry. Uh, they seem very concerned about soda taxes and the number of cities that have implemented taxes on sugary drinks where uh, consumption of sugary drinks has significantly decreased, uh, which is achieving the public health benefits that I think many of the authors of those bills intended, um, but has certainly alarmed the beverage industry. So they are the, by far the largest funder of this. Uh, Anheuser-Busch has contributed, uh, the Wine Institute, and then the California Business Roundtable PAC has also contributed to this. Am I correct in assuming that if this should pass, um, it would require our cannabis tax to go to two thirds? <laughs> That's correct. Okay, any questions of staff? Let's go to the audience, no one here to speak on this. Let's come back and um, start with Ed. Motion to adopt resolution. Second. Oh, really? <laughs> See, I thought I that four seconds. I think I thought they. I four thought, seconds. Yeah, yes. I, I knew the cannabis thing would sell it, but I just thought that there was a certain, um, you know, heartfelt vote just to make the anti-tax message come through. No. Sorry. No. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> Will the city right. clerk please note that there was four seconds? <laughs> yes. I'm like, who do I put down? All in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed. <laughs> Magical. Stephanie, I think she. No, I think she asked. I'll, I'll give her it. <laughs> I'm very disappointed in you. <laughs> I like to support you. doing the right thing. You do. You do. And I love it. Yeah, okay, we'll move on to, oh, no, what's you know, say? we go from one exciting thing to another. Let's talk about yellow curbs, Can't shall be we? better than this. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is a public works dream. Uh, a recent council meeting, the council approved some uh, changes to the curb markings on uh, Capitola Avenue, uh, up by Bay Avenue. Uh, one of them was to approve a new uh, loading zone um, there. Um, it was noted at that time that our current code had rather specific uh, requirements of a yellow zone or rules for a yellow zone, um, that there was a loading zone from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. only, and from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. It, it reverted to either parking meter or two-hour parking, uh, public parking at that time. Um, I think it was well identified that that probably is not the best use of a yellow zone up at that location. So there's a request to come back and to amend the ordinance to allow some flexibility. Um, just to make sure there was a ordinance um, making an amendment that was put in the original agenda and then we sent out a revised uh, ordinance that kind of was a little cleaner language. Um, the, what you see up here right now is the ordinance that went out on the revised one on Monday, except for the part in red. Um, I'm gonna ask you to yet again make another revision. Um, the part two refers to the two hour parking restrictions that we used to have in the village. Um, obviously that is now three hour and rather than list three hour, um, my recommendation is that we change two to, re to read between the hours during which loading and unloading restrictions are not applicable parking meter and or posted time restrictions shall apply. So basically these, these this amendment will um, still have the one to eight um, or during such hours as the superintendent of streets um, 
posts on the street, uh, those will take control. So that's it, and uh, staff recommendation is to pass for the first reading. Is there any, are there any questions of staff? Is there anyone from the audience who would like to speak to us? Stephanie, you wanna say anything? Even a motion? Move to approve. Jock, anything? Second. Anything, nothing? Ed, comments? I just wanna thank staff for bringing this back. I did request this because I want this to be successful. We're, we've made a big effort up there to, to so, kind of solve this parking problem. And if, if that loading zone were to be compromised during the day, then it wouldn't be useful at night. So First thank, class. Yeah, thank you for, for doing this, I think, and uh, thank the city attorney for adding the language to make sure that it works. But I think this is part of that whole process. Any idea when we're gonna start re-striping up there again? We've put the yellow zone in. We we're kind of waiting for this to go through and uh, we will do it. It may be after the beach closes because our crews are rather busy the next and couple of weeks. Steve, um, while you're sitting up here for the night, um, have they done anything to the face of the steps that are all yellow <laughs> all the way up? No, I apologize, but they have not gotten to that. That's yet. okay. That's okay because it's the, the paint. It's on their. It's on their four quarters. To well, no, it's to the accomplish. paint starting to flake off the face. So I'm wait. <laughs> you may want to wait till the end of that. <laughs> I apologize. Okay. No, Since no. it's yellow, it's a loading zone now. Um, I don't think we voted on this yet. So no, we have a all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Another unanimous vote. This is a record night. Um, I only have about an hour of comments left. Hang on a second. Oh. No, <laughs> I'm only kidding. Batten down the hatches. Summer's coming. Our concerts will be coming in a few weeks. Yay. The car show will be here in a few weeks. It's uh, nothing but fun, and it makes us happy to live in Capitola. So remember, Capitola, be nice to each other. Good night. Well done.